Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Rachel. So nice to see you. Yarden, so good to see you. Carolyn, so good to see you. Thank you for your poem earlier today. Cindy, so nice to see you. Heidi, Zan, so nice to see you. Oh my gosh, it's so great to see everybody. Sarah, thank you for being here. Lori, oh my gosh, we have Mary Amundel in the house. That's so fantastic. Thank you guys so much for being here. I am so excited for tonight and I'm going to stop talking because we have a special treat to start us off. Bis then I have to watch a little too. Hey, mother, sign him. I say, yes, the two lie who did me. Hey, mother, and it's so interesting to see how closed captions translates all these words. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. They say, oh. oh my gosh, the amazing Basia Schechter. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, we get more of her later, but I'm going to talk really fast because there are amazing women here who are going to teach us tonight. And I want you to hear them and not me. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. This is definitely the highlight of my week. Um, if you, while I'm rambling at you, get comfy, grab a warm drink. I'm just so yeah. glad to see all these beautiful faces. I'm Ariella Mortowitz, the founding director of Spiva. It is so wonderful to see so many new faces, some not so new faces. And please, if I don't yet know you, stay till the end. I will stick around and introduce yourself, please. If I do know you, stay around so that I can say hello because it would be so sad to miss a chance to do so. 30 seconds about Spiva. Spiva is about creating a more nourishing communal faith experience for Jewish women, where we define both Jewish and women very broadly. If you want to be with us, we want you with us and welcome. We love that we are multi-generational and diverse in our backgrounds and our affiliations, and we come together in celebration and support of women, our strengths, our unique perspectives, and our ways of contributing to the world. A reminder, many of us are new to each other, and we'd like to ask you to embrace this awesome diversity and newness and approach the conversation and each other with honesty and openness because that's what's going to make tonight so special. I want to make sure to thank those who make her tour possible. First and foremost, Rabbi Eliza, for your thoughtfulness and creativity in building these beautiful opportunities to learn with and from each other. A big thank you to the Aviv Foundation for their faith in her tour to create a unique way of learning together in community. Um, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Rabbi Eliza Sperling, the director of her Torah and our incredible educators. But I have three seconds of housekeeping. We hope that tonight is just one of the many times that we'll see your face because we do have much more coming up. The month of March is, is full of other opportunities for us to see each other. We have another her Torah coming up before Purim that on March 9th that is addressing hashtag me too and the imperative for communities to support survivors of power-based violence. Um, we have a Her Power session dedicated to the graceful exit, knowing when and how to leave a situation that is not serving you. And you can find all of the information on our website, or I will bombard you with emails because that's what I like to do. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure that we go through quickly our Sviva rules. Can you all see my screen? Awesome. Okay. Quickly, just respect everybody here. 
Uh, show up as your fabulous self. If you're washing dishes, eating dinner, walking the dog, doesn't matter. We're so glad that you're here. What happens here stays here. And please introduce yourself to someone new tonight. If you want to go out on a limb, just pick somebody random and say hello, because I can assure you that all of you are equally fabulous and worthy of being known and knowing each other. Um, let me see what else we got on tap. Oh, your names. If you don't mind taking a quick second to make sure that your name is listed as it would be if we you were name, wearing a name tag. Um, and we're going to chat away. You can see already uh, that we've asked everybody to introduce yourselves, tell us where you're Zooming from, and share if you're comfortable, what drew you here tonight, or a Torah teacher who has impacted you, and why, what was important about that person, um, or your connection to Sarah Schneer. Um, and with that, I will stop talking. <laughs> and I get to introduce one of my favorite teachers of all time, Rabbi Anita Lisa Sperling, the director and visionary behind all of her Torah. You will see her bio in the chat, and she will start us off. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Ariella, and welcome, everybody. It's so, it's so wonderful to see all of your faces. Um, Tonight, we're going to celebrate the life of Sarah Schneer upon the occasion of her 87th Yortzeit, or anniversary of her death. I'm so happy that we have so many new participants tonight, as well as people who have been here before. And I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to tell you what her Torah is about. Two and a half years ago, the fabulous Ariella Mortkowitz, from whom you have received many emails, um, started Siva a nourishing, inclusive community for Jewish women. And we define Jewish women as anyone who defines themselves as a Jewish woman. One of the programs of Sviva is Her Torah, where we gather Jewish women to learn with one another in a way that welcomes and actively seeks out diversity of age, religious background, denomination, location, income level, abilities, all of these things. We want to be a space where women from all different backgrounds can come together and learn together and engage meaningfully with one another. There, thank God, and I guess thanks Sarah Schneer, there are now places where women can get advanced Jewish education. We want Sviva to be a platform where those women can come and teach and we can all learn together with open hearts, without regard for any of the dividing lines that sometimes separate different parts of the Jewish community. We think Torah becomes stronger when people who would otherwise never meet or sit in the same space can come together and discuss ideas that are important to all of us. Tonight, we celebrate Sarah Schneer with our incredible presenters, uh, the musician Basia Schachter, who you've heard and, and you will hear again, and our teachers, Dr. Leslie Ginsberg-Klein, Talia Weisberg, and Dr. Nomi Seidman. Thank you to the four of you for sharing your knowledge and passion for Sarah Schneer with us. I thought that I was obsessed with Sarah Schneer, and then I met these four women, and I realized, wow, I'm nothing compared to them. I have been looking forward to tonight's event for a long time. I also want to especially thank Michal Porat Zibman, who posted on Facebook a few months ago, noting that this Saturday night, the 26th of Adar, will be Sarah Schneer's 87th yard site and encouraging people to mark it in some way. Michal, you are the reason we are gathered here tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, our first presenter tonight is Dr. Leslie Ginsberg Klein. Leslie is the academic dean of Women's Institute of Torah Seminary and College, an Orthodox Jewish college for women. An accomplished scholar and author, Dr. Klein speaks on Jewish history, Tanakh, leadership, and communication skills across the United States and internationally. Leslie received her PhD from NYU, where she researched the history of, orth of Orthodox girls' education in America and the Beis Yaakov movement. Tonight, Leslie will share with us who Sarah Schneer really was and her leadership secrets, how she was able to build a movement despite many difficult circumstances. Thank you so much, Leslie. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. 
So the base Yaakov movement has turned 100. It has, it's a few years, over a century, since 1917, when a then unknown woman named Sarah Schneer opened a small afternoon school in the room that had housed her seamstress workshop. A little endeavor that turned into a worldwide movement and led to all of us being here tonight. Sarah Schneer's initiative became what is arguably the greatest innovation in Jewish life in the 20th century and the most successful movement for women in Judaism in the past millennium. Sarah Schneer turned the idea of girls going to a Jewish school and learning about Torah and Judaism from something that was socially unacceptable, if not prohibited, into a way of life for Jews all over the world. And that's why all members of a Jewish community today, whether or not their family members or they themselves attended a Beis Yaakov school, they have ties to Sarah Schneer. I was just telling before you came out, before we started, I was saying how I had just seen a thread on social media where women were describing what they had learned about Sarah Schneer. And it was so interesting to see how different the perspectives are depending on where women first learned about her. Modest, traditional, radical, revolutionary. These are all words used to describe the same woman. And I'd love to throw in the chat what words you have associated with Sarah Schneer based on what you've learned, different things you've learned. Who was she? Who was this complicated personality? How did she change her Jewish community and impact Jewish society for future generations? And what can we learn from her story? I wanna talk today about Sarah Schneer's true legacies and the leadership mission that she left each and every one of us. Sarah Schneer founded Beis Yaakov in Poland in 1917. Before that time, Orthodox communities in Eastern Europe considered formal Jewish education for girls to be unnecessary, inappropriate, even forbidden by halacha, by Jewish law. For most girls, Jewish education took place in the home, taught by family members, kind of a apprenticeship program. You learn the laws of kashrut by observing the women of your family in the kitchen. For most, it was, if, and if girls were wealthy, Maybe they had private tutors, but their actual education, the way we think of it, the book learning, would generally consist of basic literacy in Yiddish and maybe enough Hebrew to read a sitter. Anything else a girl needed to know about Jewish observance could be learned by observing mothers and other women in the home. But with government laws mandating compulsory education, more and more Jewish children began attending secular state schools. And while significant numbers of boys and girls attended these, school, these schools, a far greater number of girls than boys received this type of education. Because while it could be considered bitul Torah, wasting time that could have been spent in Torah study to teach a boy secular subjects, no such consideration existed with the education of women. On the contrary, Orthodox Jews considered it preferable that women should spend time acquiring secular skills so they could later use them to support the continued learning of the men in their families. One rabbi was looking for a shidduch, a marriage match for his sister, and boasted that she knew how to write Hebrew, Polish, German fluently, and even knew Russian. Those were the qualities that could get you a good shidduch in those days. Guidelines regulating girls' secular education didn't exist. And it's actually fascinating when you think about this, that girls' marginalization with regards to their Jewish education actually led them to have great opportunity with regards to secular education, far greater than their male counterparts. But as a result of their exposure to secular learning and non-Jewish ideologies, Girls experienced a great disparity between their intellectual engagement with secular studies and their informal training in the laws and the traditions of Judaism. And that led girls to view Judaism as something that held them back, as an outdated hindrance in their lives. Assimilation, conversion, intermarriage were all rampant and those were issues for the community that day. Now, some rabbis blamed skyrocketing numbers of conversions. And mind you, these weren't conversion. Girls were converting to Catholicism in, in alarming numbers. But these conversions weren't based on any kind of sudden embrace of Catholicism. Converting was a way to escape. It was one of the only ways to kind of to escape. 
So some rabbis blame these numbers on girls' lack of Jewish education, but community leadership remains steadfastly against any innovation in women's education. 1903, there's a convention of Polish rabbis, and one of the delegates says, like, hey, we've been ignoring girls for too long. We have to establish schools for girls. And the conference unanimously opposes his suggestion. You know, it was just completely, it just shot down. And they stated in their resolutions that Jewish parents should definitely educate their daughters at home. But for the community to establish schools would be wrong. The subject continued to appear in the press, but the leadership continued to refuse to take action. Where others failed, this unknown Polish seamstress and her grassroots Space Yaakov movement would prove astoundingly successful. Sarah Schneer was born in 1883 to a Bell's Hasidic family. She grew up in Krakow. She attended state school until age 13, but her family's poor financial condition precluded her from pursuing her formal education any further. Sarah Schneer taught herself to be a seamstress, and she continued her secular education through reading and attending lectures. She actively pursued a Jewish education through self-study. She writes about studying the Tsena Ura'ena, which was standard fare for women. It was a retelling of the Chumash of the Bible with, with Midrashic commentaries woven in. However, she also mentioned studying texts that were more unusual for women to study, like a Yiddish version of the Chok L'Israel, which was a book that contained a daily portion of, of Chumash, of Navi of the Prophets, of, and of Talmud, of Mishnah and of Gemara. Sarah Schneer wrote in her autobiography that she was concerned about assimilation in her community for years before she started Beis Yaakov. Mm. She described a gap she was perceiving between girls and her families in, in this, her Hasidic community. She saw boys and men who were, in, who were involved in intense Jewish learning. They spent all the holidays getting spiritual inspiration from their Rebbe, but she viewed women's religious lives as empty. She's quoted as saying, we stay at home, the wives, the daughters with the little ones. We have an empty Yom Tov. It's bare of Jewish intellectual concentration. The women have never learned anything about the spiritual content that is concentrated within a Jewish festival. The mother goes to shul, to synagogue. The service rings faintly into the fenced and boarded off women's gallery. There is much crying by the elderly, women and the young girls look at them as beings of a different century. They walk away from Shul where their mothers pour out their vague and heavy feelings. They leave behind them the wailing of the older generation and follow the urge for freedom and self-expression. Sarah Schneer perceived that girls and young, and young women, they were growing disconnected from religion. They were going from disconnected from tradition. It held no meaning for them. They had no way to be Jewish. And she blamed that distance on their lack of Jewish education and engagement. She deeply wanted to work with girls and be a catalyst for change in her community, but she didn't see how that could be possible. See, Sarah Schneer was a really unlikely candidate to be a revolutionary leader. She was poor, she was divorced, she was uneducated, not formally educated, and she was a woman in a society where any one of those things alone would have been an impediment. And in addition to financial difficulties, she faced all this personal adversity. Sarshner didn't fit in. She was teased for her piety. When she would talk to friends about Judaism, they made fun of her. They called her the Hasidishte, literally would translate as the little pious one. In playground language, little Miss Hasid, little Miss Frummy, she was already an older single when she got married at the age of 27, and her marriage was an unhappy one, ending in divorce three years later. And obviously, this was a time when divorce was a, a major source of stigma. She remarried in her late 40s, but she, she never had children. And yet, in spite of being having all of this adversity, different types of adversity in her life and kind of not fitting into the mold, she overcame the odds to found an educational movement and become a leader and role model for the ages. 
Sarah Shear's reluctance to get involved, her lack of confidence in her ability to make a difference, changed when she was exposed to the Western Jewish ideology of Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, who had responded to assimilation through an intellectual understanding of traditional Judaism and had provided ways to synthesize Judaism with modern times. Rabbi Hirsch also adv advocated education for women. Sarah Schneer attended the synagogue of a Rabbi Dr. Flesch, who was a follower of Rabbi Hirsch in Vienna, where she lived during World War I when Krakow had gotten to be a dangerous place because of the war. And his sermons, invite, his sermons inspired her. She talks about one speech as being a particularly defining moment. On, on Shabbat Hanukkah, he spoke about the heroics of women in the Hanukkah story and encouraged the women present to be heroines as well. She was taken with the fact that not only was this rabbi speaking about women from the pulpit, he was speaking to women directly, something that would never have happened in a Polish synagogue. Sarah Schneer determined to answer this call and to devote herself to saving Jewish girls through education. Mm. She believed that if she could teach the girls what she was learning, they'd be similarly inspired. So upon her return to Vienna, she immediately gets to work on this project, building support, organizing meetings. Her first idea wasn't a school. It was to create a youth movement, a youth society, similar to those of secular ideolo ideological movements, the, the other isms of the time, socialism, communism, Zionism. They were so popular with Jewish youth. So she gets a group of teenage girls together. She's so excited. She's going to launch her movement. And she failed. The girls made fun of her. And she could have quit, but she didn't. She tried again and she failed again. And she endured a number of failures before she switched her focus from working with teens to starting a school for young girls in 1917, hoping that younger girls would be more receptive. And they were. She opens her first school. She has 25 students. Within a few months, 40 students. Then 80 students, words of the school spread and other towns start petitioning her to, for help replicating the school in other locations. She starts a teacher training program to train older girls to staff the new schools. The trainees studied, ate, and slept alongside Schneer in her small apartment. Over time, over the next basically 20 years, the Base Yaakov movement grew to include day schools, afternoon programs for girls attending public school, secondary schools, trade schools, hachsharot that prepared students for aliyah, summer institutes, youth groups, publications, and famous teacher seminary, which kind of was the crown jewel of the movement, which is, which is interesting that ultimately Base Yaakov did become the youth movement, the social movement that she wanted, but only years later. By the year 1937, Beis Yaakov had over 35,000 students in 248 schools, and it has inspired education for girls across the Jewish community. There are schools that, that aren't Beis Yaakov in religious ideology, but have still tied their model themselves after the Beis Yaakov schools. And there are so many incredible legacies of Sarah Schneer. Indeed, for leaders and activists today, one of the most important lessons we learn from her is how to successfully balance tradition and innovation. On the one hand, Sarah Schneer was reconnecting girls with the past. She was reinstating tradition. On the other hand, she went about reinstating tradition in a very modern way. She challenged convention after convention in a highly conservative society. She called for change in an anti-innovation society. Modest, radical, traditional, revolutionary, can this all exist in one person? So a clue lies in a speech that she herself gave. She taught her students that they have to learn to balance two important concepts. The idea of turning inward for that traditional Jewish concept of modesty and the need of turning outward for extraordinary action. She did, Sarsher did not believe that tradition and innovation were mutually exclusive. You could be a traditional revolutionary. She was a traditional revolutionary. She pushed hard for change, but she did so in a way that was respectful of tradition and respect of, respectful of the system. Every step of the way, she was so strategic, so strategic about how she went about things and got support and ultimately went about achieving her goals. Sarah Schneer taught her students the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, in Ethics of the Fathers. 
במקום שאין אנשים, השתדל להיות איש. So literally that trans, literally, what it really means is in a place where there's no leaders, strive to be a leader, but the literal translation is a place where there's no men, strive to be a man. And she would say, there are times, this is what she would tell her students, there are times, there are communities where there are no men to care. Then you must stand up and be that man who takes responsibility in his own hands. She saw the damage that the status quo was inflicting on girls and women, and she stood up and she took responsibility. She taught her students to do the same. And what kind of differentiates her from what was happening, again, she wasn't the first one to have the idea of, hey, you know what, maybe Jewish education for girls is a good idea. But people, they were talking about it, they're debating it. And while everyone else is sitting around talking and debating and thinking about it and arguing, she just went ahead and did it. She did the work that needed to be done. And that's why we remember her name. And we don't know the names of all of her detractors. Naomi Simon, who we'll hear from later, suggests that actually because Sarah Schneer was a woman, she could circumvent that religious debate that had paralyzed the male leadership from taking action. Because, hey, the world of halachic debate, of the debates over the Jewish law, that was a male world. Women weren't part of that world. And therefore they could not and did not need to engage with the issue of the permissibility, the halachic permissibility of girls learning Torah the way men did. What Sarah Schneer effectively did was she used the marginalization within of women and within her community to her advantage, to base Yaakov's advantage. This also kept her disentangled from the politics that often surrounded these religious decisions and these religious divisions, which just goes to show you that some community work is best done by women or can only effectively be done by women. And starting school was not the only instance of Sarah Schneer innovating in her time, it was not socially acceptable for single girls to or women to attend synagogue on the Sabbath. However, she felt that it was essential to her students' spiritual development that they pray with a minion, that they pray with that form of prayer in synagogue. So she just started taking her students to synagogue along with her and thereby changed another custom of society. Globally, right? Globally. And, and I love like, you know, I, these are things that I'm thinking of, her legacies, the changes that, that she made. If, any, if you, anyone in the audience has other ideas, I would love to see them in the chat. Like where are places that you see her influence in our community today or in any community today in the world today? So globally, Sarah Schneer and Beis Yaakov successfully created new and exciting opportunities for Jewish women, religiously, educationally, professionally, communally. So first, okay, so she introduced girls and women to a new world of studying Jewish subjects and made Jewish education for girls an indisputably accepted community norm. Women and girls are no longer ignorant of their traditions. They know halacha, they know how to daven, how to pray, how to learn. For many women, this knowledge and the ability to intellectually engage with Torah is a major source of inspiration and of connection to Judaism. And the level of Jewish learning for women has only continued to rise. And the story of Sarah Schneer and Beis Yaakov suggests that the more, the more girls and women are engaged in high level secular studies, which we all are, the more engaged in the world, the more challenging the world is, the more compelling, challenging, rigorous, exciting, and relevant their Jewish education needs to be. And in early accounts of Beis Yaakov, authors lauded the academic and spiritual accomplishments of students. Sarah Schneer herself had longed for a Jewish education and she sought Jewish education for her students as a means of inspiration, of intellectual attainment and spiritual liberation. She saw Torah study as a path for girls to become teachers, leaders, and to grow in spirituality, commitment and connection to God and to Torah. It was of paramount importance. And the measures of success for Beis Yaakov in Europe were related to girls' learning and spiritual accomplishment. For example, one, one man is writing about his life in Europe. He lauded his aunt, who had returned from the Beis Yaakov Seminary, quote, not only a milumedas, an educated woman, but an excellent public speaker as well. He also recalled during the Holocaust meeting a female cousin who had smuggled herself across the border into Lithuania to escape the Nazis. You dared to smuggle across the border? I asked in anger. 
So did you, came the reply. But I am different, he said. I am a Ben Torah. So am I a Bas Torah, she responded. She was a graduate, he writes, she was a graduate of the Beis Yaakov Seminary in Krakow, and the flame of Sarah Schneer was burning within her. Sarah Schneer provided not only an education, but a way to live a Jewish life. Instead of religious lives being empty, girls and women now had a way to connect. They had their own sect of Hasidism, and Sarah Schneer was their Rebbe. Students through the years have expressed a feeling of being part of a female Mesorah, a female tradition extending back through Sarah Schneer. In the past, men always had their rabbis to connect to. Right? I learned from this rabbi, who learned from that rabbi, who learned from that rabbi and that rabbi, and that was a source of, of legitimizing themselves and a source of connecting themselves back to the Jewish past. But women didn't have that. But now women had their own misora. They have their own way to connect back to their heritage. Through, to all the way back to their biblical foremothers and the righteous women of generations past. Their link in the chain was Sarah Schneer. This Masora, this tradition connected girls and women to the past and provided an important and essential mission for the future. Beis Yaakov also offered women leadership opportunities that enhanced Jewish life. Sarah Schneer saw a need for girls to have female leaders with whom to forge a connection. And her movement trained women to be those leaders and educators for the next generation. The Beis Yaakov school system's primary goal was to create qualified women leaders to run new Beis Yaakov schools. And it did. And those women students went on to start schools. And Beis Yaakov helped create these new Jewish leaders that continued to influence ensuing generations. Sarah Schneer, before her death, wrote an ethical will to her students. And its strong, overarching message is, be leaders. She writes, now I turn to you, my beloved children, who are heading into the wide world to educate and guide Jewish daughters. I trust you understand your lofty calling. Remember, the fate of the younger generation and thus of the entire people is dependent on you. So be strong, be steadfast in your holy work, be strong in the face of everything. She charged all of us with a lofty calling, a sacred calling to be leaders. And she tells us how. She saw a problem. She saw Jewish girls disengaged and alienated. And she implemented a solution, educate and empower. She saw that the community's approach was no longer working. And while remaining traditional, she, she pushed for innovation and creativity. And she, Sarah Schneer demonstrates that innovation is an integral part of Jewish life. And a commitment to Misora, to tradition, does not preclude an understanding that if we remain complacent and we don't continue to move forward with respect to building and expanding educational and leadership opportunities for women and girls, we will be failing as a community. What worked 10, 20, 30 years ago does not necessarily work today. We have to be constantly assessing and improving for our generation and for the next generation. Sarah Schneer teaches us the power of the individual, that one person can make an incredibly positive change. And her legacy is the power of grassroots advocacy. It's about persisting in the face of apathy, of ignorance and opposition. And it is the realization that each and every one of us has a lofty calling and the belief that we will be successful in achieving it. As Sarah Schneer herself wrote after her initial failures in 1915, who cares about doubts? Who cares about obstacles? Who cares if many laugh and ridicule my plan? What role does my personal pride play here? If the intent is sincere and the aim is pure, my goal will certainly be achieved. And hopefully we can all learn from her to similarly answer this lofty calling and may our goals be achieved. Wow, thank you so much, Leslie. That was amazing. I kept wanting to write down what you said, but then I heard another sentence you said that I wanted to write down even more. So I'll have to go back and listen to the recording. Um, thank you so much. I love how passionate all of our presenters are about this incredible woman. Um, for those of you who have questions, at, at the end, after our presenters have, have, um, have spoken, we'll have time for Q&A and you can ask some questions then. 
All right, our next speaker is Talia Weisberg. Talia is a student at Yeshivat Maharat. She volunteers as the ritual chair on the board of the Orthodox Minyan at Har Harvard Hillel, a minyan that caters to students, young professionals, and young families in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She earned her Bachelor's of Arts at Harvard in the Comparative Study of Religion with a secondary field in women, gender, and sexuality. Her senior honors thesis explored the Beis Yaakov Girls School Movement, of which she is an alumna, and its role in the evolution of Orthodox women's formal religious education. By the way, I think all of our presenters tonight are alumna of uh, Beis Yaakov Schools. Am I right about that? Um, Talia will share with us about Sarah Schneer's favorite psukim uh, or verses and the impact of those verses upon Sarah Schneer and I hope upon Talia as well. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Reverend Eliza, um, Ariel, all of my co-presenters um, for making today happen. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I, I've been really nerdily passionate about Sarah Schneer for many years at this point. Um, I, I went to Manhattan High School for Girls, which is a base Yaakov type school. Um, and when I was in 10th grade, we did our school production about the life and legacy of Sarah Schneer. Um, and productions at, at MHS were like a really, really big deal. It was like an entire year that we spent immersed in Sarah Schneer. Um, and ever since then, I've been just incredibly compelled by her story, um, you know, which we just heard from Dr. Klein. Um, so much so that I, I actually ended up writing, as, as uh, Reverend Anita Liza said, my honors thesis in college about the Beis Yaakov movement. Um, and, you know, I, I went to Harvard, so it was not the kind of place where anyone was expecting me to write about Sarah Schneer. But, you know, there you go. You, you can take the girl out of Beis Yaakov, but you can't take the Beis Yaakov out of the girl, as they say. Um, so I just I continue to find a lot of awe and inspiration in Sarah Schneer, both as a person and for everything she stands for. Um, so I hope I could share a little bit uh, today with you guys uh, more about why why that is. Um, so today, you know, we, we're hearing from academics, we're hearing from artists. Um, I, I want to present a perspective that's a little bit more explicitly centered on Torah. Uh, what is the Torah that we can learn from Sarah Schneer? What Torah of hers can we bring into our lives today? Um, and I, I should say before I speak that there's going to be a lot of God talk here. Um, so Frau Schneer, as her students called her, was uh, a deeply spiritual and God-centered person. Um, and it's, it's really uh, basically impossible to talk about her and her Torah without talking about God. Um, so for anyone who's maybe not sure what God is to them or how exactly they connect to God or what their relationship with God looks like right now, you know, I just want you to sit with that. I, I don't want you to feel self-conscious. Put whatever exactly God means to you right now into these places where I invoke God. And just, you know, think about this as a spiritual exercise. And for those of you with thriving and confident relationships with God, you know, that's great too. Let's keep going. Viter, as uh, my, my teachers in high school would say. Um, so uh, as Rabbi Elisa said, there's, uh, I would like to explore this idea of these four uh, biblical verses, these four psukim, uh, that Sarah Schneer viewed as her call to action. Um, every basic Yaakov girl learns about these psukim. Um, I, I actually, although did a uh, informal poll of my friends from high school, um, and none of them actually remember these psukim. So I'm not sure what it says about me that I, I do. Um, but I digress. Um, so the, these four psukim, um, I'll, I'll read them in Hebrew and then in English. Um, the first one, in, in no particular order, um, is Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha, worship God with joy. Limnos yamenu kein hoda. Teach us to count our days rightly. Shivisi Hashem Linegdi Summit. I am ever mindful of God's presence. And our fourth and final one, Vitaher Libenu La Avdecha Be'emes. Purify our hearts to serve you, to serve God in truth. Um, and I'm, I'm pronouncing them the Ashkenazi way, the way that I was taught, the way uh, Schneer would have said them. Uh, so those first three that I listed are from Tehillim, are from the Psalms. Um, and the last one actually is not a Pasuk. Um, it actually just appears, you know, several times throughout liturgy, um, both Ashkenazi and Swati traditions, uh, comes up in, in Shabbos davening and uh, Shabbat morning prayer. So I, I want to think, even though these come from all over to Hillam, all over the place, I, I want to think about them as a unit. What do these Pesukim say about who Sarishnir was? So on the Pasuk, Shivisi Hashem Nagdi Samad, I'm ever mindful of God's presence. Uh, I'm going to look at the commentary of the Mitsudis David. Um, he was a 17th century commentator. Uh, he wrote on Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the, the prophets and writings, uh, which are the second and third parts of Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible after the Torah. 
Um, so the Matutus David, I think, beautifully explains this idea. I am ever mindful of God's presence um, in a very simple way. Um, and I quote uh, in English, the translation is mine. Always think that God stands before me and sees my actions. And uh, a separate sentence, because of this, Hashem stands to my right to help me and will not let me fall. Um, so I, I don't know this for sure, but I think that it's likely that Frau Schneerer would have had access to the Matsuda stuff. Um, probably uh, Dr. Seidman or Dr. Klein could tell me for sure. Um, and I like to think of her reading this commentary as she built Beis Yaakov from the ground up, you know, just imagining God standing before her and approving of her actions and ensuring that she would not fall, that giving her the confidence and the knowledge that Beis Yaakov was what the world needed and that she would therefore succeed in her endeavor. Uh, she, as, as Dr. Klein said, she went from a classroom of 25 girls in her seamstress studio in 1917 to an almost 300 strong network of schools around Europe, mandatory Palestine, and North America uh, by her death around 20 years later. Uh, but there's no way she could have known that, you know, when she just had a room of girls surrounded by sewing machines. Uh, I hope that we can all find that confidence within us, uh, that whenever we embark on a project, we can all think of Hashem standing before us, approving of our actions and goals helping us stand upright and keep us from falling. Even if it seems like we won't succeed, that we're not sure what the future will hold, that we can keep this in our hearts. Carry it in, in our hearts, if you will. Which that was a phrase of Sarah Schneer's. I hope uh, Dr. Seidman might deal with that later. Um, so uh, Dr. Klein spoke earlier about how Sarah Schneer was exposed to the philosophical works of Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, uh, the, the German rabbi who is the intellectual founder of modern day orthodoxy. Um, so uh, he, he has a, a sitter, a, a prayer book with his commentary, and uh, in, in the commentary on his sitter, Rev Hirsch writes about the phrase, purify our hearts to serve you, God, in truth. And I quote, um, he says, uh, translation is in English, it's not mine. Uh, we ask God to enable us to attain such purity of heart and attitude that we will do your bidding, your God's bidding, without any other motive in mind than the performance of your will. End quote. So Sarah Schneer almost certainly either read this commentary or herself or heard it directly from Rav Flesch, who was uh, uh, Rav Hirsch's uh, disciple that she heard from in Vienna. Um, so I think it's, it's really cool to think about how she would have related to those words knowing this commentary that we have here. Um, if this Pasuk was one of her calls to action, this means that her goal and the goal she had for her students and her students' students and her students' students and you know all of us here today was to do God's will to think only of what Hashem wanted her to do. The entire project of girls' formal religious education that she embarked on was with God as the end goal. She asked, what can I do to serve God? What unique job do I, Sarshneer, have? How can I bring more God into this world? And the answer she came to was, I can teach girls and women. I can do the holy work of reaching out to my fellow women, my fellow girls, and touching them and, and giving them God. What, what an amazing thing, you know, to believe in yourself so strongly, to believe in your mission so strongly, to believe that your work is ordained by heaven, to want to give access to God and Torah to people who don't have it but deserve it. How powerful it is to find a mission that centers on others, that relies on others to find fulfillment to succeed. I just, I, I, think, I think that's just so, so amazing. Um, a, a lot of the time with um, modern day religious feminism, uh, there are accusations of like not doing it for the right reasons, that women who seek to go above and beyond their religious duty are trying to be men or trying to prove a point or whatever else they're accused of. Um, I, I hope that all of us who find ourselves in this situation can draw on the strength that Sarah Schneer embodied and the deep connection to God that she had and that she wanted to pass on to her students and say, my heart is pure. I serve God with truth. I am in this for God. Uh, I, I have limited time and I want to hear from all the other, you know, amazing speakers we have and uh, hear from all of you. So I won't go into depth about the other two psukim that uh, Sarah Schneer championed, uh, but I think it's clear how they informed her work. Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha, worship God with joy. She clearly found overt joy in her service of God and the creation and facilitation of Beis Yaakov, a project she worked on for, you know, 20 or so years uh, at the end of her life. Um, in ensuring Jewish women and girls had the ability to find connection with Torah. Uh, 
teach us to count our days rightly. Uh, she, she died young. She was in her 50s. Uh, but she made every day count. She woke up every morning and she asked God how to use her day. And she maximized her short years in this world by building a movement that has now outlived her for 87 years and is still going strong. You know, and it's amazing to think this wasn't even something she spent her entire life on. It was only the last 20 or so years. And yet look at what she accomplished. Uh, people were in the chat were discussing this, that, you know, Sarah Schneer was not the first person to give girls a Torah education, uh, but she was the first person to find, you know, widespread, widespread international success doing it. Um, she's an example of a really deeply pious, Hasidish, you know, person, uh, a woman who cared deeply for her own spirituality and the girls and women around her. She knew how rich a personal connection to Torah and God could be, and she wanted to give that to others. She used her psukim as confidence to boost herself with the knowledge that God was with her and wanted her to do what she was doing. I think this is an important lesson to learn from the life of Sarah Schneer. When we find that inner confidence, there is nothing we cannot do. Whether we find that confidence through God or Torah or some other avenue, when we have that, the possibilities are endless. These psukim show us that there is no limit to the height that God and God's Torah can take us. Sarah Schneer showed the world that the Torah, and by extension, full and unfettered access to God, belongs to girls and women as much as it belongs to boys and men. It is our imperative as Jewish women to take the Torah that we now have and to run with it, to cling to it tightly, and live out the legacy that Frau Schneer gave us. May we all find inspiration from the words that inspired Sarah Schneer. May we all find ways to authentically and honestly connect to God whatever that means to us. And I'll, I'll just repeat her psukim because I think it's always best to end with, end with words of Torah in your mouth. Uh, so the psukim again, uh, I'll say in, in Hebrew and then English. Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha, worship God with joy. Limnos yamenu kein hoda, teach us to count our days rightly. Shivisi Hashem l'negdi summit, I'm ever mindful of God's presence. And v'taher libenu l'abdecha b'emes, Purify our hearts to serve you, to serve God in truth. And I'll actually end on a bonus pasuk. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is not one that Sarshnir was known to be especially fond of, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it's one that I, I think about often and that I think we might be, be hearing later as well. Uh, it's from Sefer Yeshaya, the, the book of Isaiah. Um, the prophet cries out to the people, Beis Yaakov, lechu v'nelcha ve'ar Hashem. House of Jacob, Beis Yaakov, Come, let us walk by the light of God. I love that. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Talia. That was amazing. I love the words that everybody is saying. And I love seeing your faces as you're saying those things. It's really so inspiring. Thank you. So Sarah Schneer taught that there is really no obstacle that can stand in your way when you are committed to doing something. And uh, Basia, hopefully, is here even yes you, you're here so Basia is not letting anything stand in her way either she is in costa rica she is perhaps in a bathroom because her son is, is sleeping in the bedroom and she is still here thank you so much Basia. um Basia is now going to sing to us one of the original songs of the basiakov movement Thank you so much. It's been such an incredible program already, like brilliant and so inspiring. And, you know, just for someone who grew up in the Beis Yaakov movement and um, like, I don't know, for all of you who has have some kind of connection to that. Uh, we grew up as musicians because we used to sit around during recess and sing together in harmonies. We would just sing together in harmonies and we didn't have our own songs, but we had songs that we would find our own voices by finding our own harmonies. And so everybody would find their voice in the collective. And that was something very special to um, the way I grew up being inspired musically. And when I met Naomi Seidman, um, many years ago, when I went to San Francisco, um, you know, she was someone who was, you know, who's forging this path in the Basiakov movement and through her research. And she connected to me um, after her book and that she found 
found this um, in the archives in 1930, from the 1931 archives, this song called the Beis Yaakov Anthem. And these are, these are songs that I think are not in a book, but these are some of the research that she did afterwards. And Danny Bernstein also, who's on this call, um, was part of this, that um, her grandmother actually had a chorus to the song that wasn't originally in the um, original archives with the music musical notes. So it's interesting to see how these songs evolve. Even the way I sing, I sang Beis Yaakov um, I just, um, we just, uh, we sang that at the very beginning. It was different um, when we all get, gathered to get today for sound check. We're like, oh no, I sang it this way. I sang it this way. So it's just, these are little interesting things that go into it. And this Beis Yaakov anthem is really like, like a cheer. It's like, like a like, like we are, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're the daughters of, 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 uh, of Jacob and we sing and we learn together and, you know, and hatred can't hit us. You know, it's a lot of this, it's inspiration. It's a lot of like this kind of stuff. And it's like, how do we all like, you know, like whatever. So I'm going to sing this song as part of, um, I feel like my Basiakov accent is also coming back. I don't know if that's actually, actually happening, but maybe I'm not. Okay. This is. Um, the base Jacob anthem. Here's Adam B. Fagelifly. Here's Adam B. Blimelech and Fab. Here's Adam Chabed is Gitraya. Here can Darren Yonkas get Lo mirale, lo mirale, gain and toy it is bad. Lo mirale, lo mirale, gain and toy it is bad. Mir lernen und singen zusammen. Mir lernen Frieden banan. Kein Sinne bei uns nicht verran. Die Teure, sie ist unsere Bahn. Lo mirale, lo mirale, Tide is it. Lo mirale, lo mirale, gain and tide is it. Wir sehen im Getrei unser Beute. Wir hätten sein heilige Gebot. Wir schweren zu halten die Teure. Zu dienen dem einzigen Gott. Sing with me. La mirale, la mirale, gain and toy is best. La mirale, la mirale, gain and toy is best. La mirale, la mirale, gain and toy is best. La Wow, thank you so much, Basia. That was amazing. Um, I was so excited to hear Basia sing that I forgot to read her bio. I'll just, I'll read a little small part of it. Basia Schechter is widely acclaimed as a songwriter, musician, and performing artist. She is perhaps best known for her group Pharaoh's Daughter, a seven-piece world, world music ensemble that travels effort, effortlessly through continents and language with a genre-bending sound. Her work explores and explodes orthodox musical idioms. She has been arranging the archival Beis Yaakov songs for a band and a choir. The Beis Yaakov project will record, distribute, and perform this music in a range of venues. Find her and her music at pharaohsdaughter.com. Thank you so much, Basia. All right, next we are going to hear from Nomi Seidman. I just happen to have her book here, um, Sarah Schneer and the Base Yaakov Movement. Uh, and we're so happy that Nomi is here. And I'm also, I have to say on a personal note, I'm so happy that all of our presenters here are really coming and speaking with us today on a, on a really personal note, right? Not just in academic ways, but really to mark Sarah Schneer's yard site to really talk about what Sarah Schneer meant to them or means to them. Nomi Seidman is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. 
and a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow. Her 2019 book, Sara Schneerer and the Base Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, explores the history of the movement in the interwar period. Nomi's book was a finalist in the National Jewish Book Awards Education and Jewish Identity category and a winner in the Women's Studies category. Nomi is one of the founders, or perhaps founded, the Beis Yaakov Project, which is dedicated to the collection, preservation, and digitization of historical material related to the Beis Yaakov movement from its founding in 1917 through today. Nomi, we're so happy that you're here. Nomi is going to talk about why she loves Sarah Schneer. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Elisa, for inviting me and thank you all my wonderful co-panelists and, mm -hmm. and also thank you to Michal Zidman because Michal six months ago said, what are we gonna do for Sarah Schneer's yard site? And we had all these grand schemes and we were gonna have just people staying up all night in like seven different cities. And, and in the end, I don't know, life got in the way and neither of us really managed to get it together. Even though Michal is in Poland right now with a group of women. And um, uh, I told her it was okay that she could go to sleep, that she didn't have to stay up till three in the morning because this was being recorded. And I'm thinking that maybe next year because this just feels like the beginning. I mean, this, the Besiaco, the Sarah Schneer and Besiaco book is, I mean, I know this sounds a little boastful, but it's the fourth book I've written and I've never had an experience with writing. Usually I write a book and by the time it's done, it's like forgotten. And this one is just starting is how I feel. I just, it, it's given so much to my life and it's introduced me to so many amazing people. And yes, we're gonna make a record of the interwar music and combined with new music and Basia is gonna do that. And Pearl Gluck is in Israel and going to Poland working on a documentary about Sarah Schneer. So um, it's just starting is how it feels. And I'm hoping that next year and the year after, it's just gonna grow and we're really gonna remember this one. So uh, it, it, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I have like about 12 slideshows about Beis Yaakov and Sarah Schneer. And since we haven't seen any images, I, I only have a little amount of time, but maybe we'll just like really quickly run through a few images so that if people don't know those images, you'll get, in, you, you'll get a, a, a just feel for what we're talking about. So um, where is my, oh, here we go. Um, uh, I think I do slideshow from current slide. Okay, that was the song we just heard. This is the, um, the, the 1931 uh, songbook that I found in the archive in, at the Evo. And I didn't even really look at it. It didn't occur to me until the book was in press that we should be singing these songs, right? So for the book, for the book talk that I gave at the Center for Jewish History, I called Basia and she was immediately like, yes, right, we'll sing these songs. As you can see, we're very lucky. We have the, the, the notes for them too, even the ones that we don't have people who remember them. And what am I showing you here? For those of you who don't know, don't know I always feel very self-conscious about so showing Sarah Schneer's image because those of you who went to Beis Yaakov know she didn't, she didn't want her picture taken and not because she was so modest, but because she thought she was ugly. And um, this was the drawn image that circulated, the, the image on the bottom left in, into our period. Um, so a kind of Photoshopped image, which I guess she was okay with. It appeared in her collected writings, the advertised as the first Sefer, the first holy book written by a Jewish woman. Um, this is a stamp from the school system in Israel. And what you see on the bottom, on, on the right, and there's the one photo that we have, I deliberately did it, it's, it's a passport or ID card application, also from the archives, just emerged 10, 15 years ago, deliberately small. It's my way of like honoring her wish a little bit. Um, what you see is a just hot off the press, published a few weeks ago, comic book in Polish called Sara Imenu. So in case you think this is just us, it's happening all over the world. It turns out we can't live without Sara Schneer. Sarah Schneer. This comic book is being, um, I just interviewed the writers. Um, we, I got up very early in the morning to interview them yesterday, and I'm hoping to start you know, presenting their work more. So in terms of Beis Yaakov images, this is probably the most famous graph of 
the incredibly rapid growth of the system. And just to point this out, she was basically working entirely on her own until 1925, at which point there were 49 schools. Um, this is a, a map of the system put together in 1931. Um, and these are some of the, the Central European male administrators who came to tour the system, which is why we have this beautiful map. Um, these are some images. The school was a lot of different things. It was after school programs, high schools, vocational programs. Um, it was also theater. As those of you who went to Beis Yaakov, as I did, you know, theater is a huge part of the Beis Yaakov experience. And it was right from the start. Um, Sarsner herself wrote many plays. And um, um, it's wonderful that there are plays about Sarsner. She was theater crazy, like a lot of other people of her time. There's a 1926 um, poster on the left for a Beis Yaakov play. Um, I, there's just so many other things I want to talk about. So I'm going to stop my share. But um, uh, the Beis Yaakov play already has a professional poster in 1926. Okay, how many more minutes do I have? Okay, so my own relationship with Sarah Schneer. Let me give you a story. So, I, you know, it, it, it wasn't immediate. I didn't leave Beis Yaakov and feel like I love Sarah Schneer. I basically didn't think about her for the decades after I left Beis Yaakov and the Orthodox world. Um, and I'm not going to read a bunch of Torah verses because that's not my relationship with Sarah Schneer. I, it's very different. I actually didn't even realize I was falling in love with uh, Sarah Schneer. Um, it had, I was basically sitting in the Center for Jewish History, reading through microfiche issues of the Beis Yaakov Journal. It's a Yiddish journal that was put out by the Beis Yaakov system um, from 1923 to 1939, the longest running Yiddish uh, journal for women in interwar Poland, in a state of kind of irritation because it was freezing in the archive and because I was reading on microfiche and because it was all very pious and I'm not pious anymore. And it's sometimes hard for me to read a lot of that piety. And I was, um, I start, I'm scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And I see a little notice that says, uh, um, Tehillim uh, gathering for Sarah Schneer. And I'm thinking, Oh, that's right. Sarah Schneer died in 1935. And this is the end of 1934. And suddenly my interest perks. And I keep scrolling. And there's a letter from the hospital in Vienna where she's being treated. Vienna was a really important city in Sarah Schneer's life for various reasons. Um, and then I, I my yeah, and then my uh, my heart starts racing, and I I fo fast forwarding on this microfiche, and then I get to the the one I, I should have a, a, a an image of this, you know, just the word Sarishner and her dates, the black border, and even remembering it just now, I basically started to cry. I'm in the sent the the reading room of you know, at the Center for Jewish History, reading stuff on microfilm, surrounded by freezing cold scholars, and I'm weeping, and somebody comes over to me. I mean, I was trying to keep it together. Someone comes over to me and says, are you all right? And I said, I mean, they must have thought I was out of my mind. I said, Sarah Schneer died. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know if they knew who Sarah Schneer was. Like, okay, there's a crazy person in the archive. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. So what is it that got to me about Sarah Schneer? I mean, and the truth is that, that researching the book, I cried many times. At one point, I was, I was writing about, I was writing a little piece in the introduction to my book about how Sarah Schneer tried to bring the, the hearts of the mothers back to the daughters. Um, and I said, in some way, she did that with my mother. And um, I, again, I'm in a cafe and I'm again crying. I said, she, because I interviewed my mother at the end of my research, I interviewed, my mother went to a base Yaakov in Chernovitz between 1937 and 1939. And we had, my relationship with my mother has gotten so much deeper, even though my mother doesn't understand why a basically secular OTD woman 
can't get enough stories about Beis Yaakov out of her. So what is it? I mean, how, how, did this, how did this woman speak to me in particular? And I know there are other people in the room, Vasya, I mean, so I don't want to out anybody, but you know, those of us who went to Beis Yaakov and left, we still often somehow have a connection with Sarish Nearer, um, no longer Orthodox. So, I mean, one of the things that really got to me was reading her diary and understanding how lonely she was. I mean, the image of Beis Yaakov that I got, the image of Sarah Schneer that I got in Beis Yaakov was she was just another from lady who wanted everybody else to be from. She wouldn't like me. She wouldn't like, you know, that I'm wearing pants now, et cetera. She, it's true, as Talia said, she was an incredibly religious person. What, what I didn't understand at the time that was to be, a, a, to have that kind of religious drive was to make you a freak at her in, in that time and place. Women were just not like that. Women were, you know, when she was engaged to this man that she wasn't in love with, um, she had to go spend, you know, teas with her mother-in-law and they would talk about, you know, clothes. And she would just think, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to be like this? And then, you know, in her reading, reading about her marriage, she thought she was a monster because she didn't love her husband. And then she thought, and who am I to complain? I'm so ugly and I don't have money. I'm lucky I got a husband at all. That's what everybody tells me. And why do I, you know, and my husband doesn't want to hear all my crazy ideas for bringing Orthodox, for bringing girls back to Orthodoxy. Um, she had no, her parents, she couldn't tell her parents. I mean, basically everyone thought she was crazy. People she spent a lot of time with, her sister that she was close to, she would go on vacation with people and she'd be the only person who was careful about kosher on vacation. Everybody else was like, on vacation, you can be a little, she was odd. She, and her, her religiosity was odd. I mean, she talked to God, she had experiences of God on the mountaintop. Um, she went for 11 mile hikes. She wasn't having Orthodox women's experiences of God, whatever those were, I mean, which were thin. Um, and so, so reading the diary just made me feel so intimately connected to her. And then reading that she was on the streets of Krakow, she was called the Gigetta, which means the divorcee, the divorced woman. And I can assure you, none of, none of her nicknames were nice. And she was made, for, I mean, and the thing that really got me was to realize that her loneliness didn't stop when she, when Beis Yaakov was founded. It wasn't over. It was... By the time Beis Yaakov really got off the ground, she was already kind of old and she never was like young looking, right? I mean, one of the things about that comic book is they wanted to show her as a young woman because they wanted to give some impression of, you know, what she may have been like because she's so, she's already old in all those stories, even though she died at the age of 51. Um, and so they put her, they made her be the mother she wanted sisters. She felt that these girls she wanted to bring back to Judaism, she wanted to be their sister. They insisted on seeing her as the mother. Um, and the story that really, I mean, made me weep was reading at the very end of her life, she shows up in the seminary and people are just freaked out because she's basically on the verge of death. She's dying of stomach cancer and she's moved to be a block closer to the seminary because she can't stand to be so far away. And the seminary was built and there was an apartment there for a school caretaker and that apartment was not for her. The whole administration, basically one of the things I've discovered in the research is that basically they tried to expel her from her own system periodically and replace her in all kinds of ways. And yet she's moving to be a block away from the seminary and she spends however long it takes to climb out of bed to just go sit in the lobby and all these girls are walking by and they're just freaked out. And that image of, and you know, again, this idea that all she cared about was, you know, bringing girls back to Torah. She also was, I mean, one of the things I'm sure of, she also was looking to make a kind of light for herself within orthodoxy, um, a way for her to be there as the kind of religious freak and weirdly gendered person that she was, because let's face it, she was. Um, and that's what she wanted Beis Yaakov to be. And it, yes, it exceeded beyond her greatest dreams. And in some way, she continued to be kind of lost in a facade of who they needed her to be, even you know, in the height of her 
uh, success and in her the height of her and there was something about that that made her for me and that continues to make her for me a really um, in some ways a tragic figure but someone that I feel I felt I mean one of the things that happens is when you spend you know years reading everything someone has written you get it's not just that you get information you get a feel for somebody and Sarah Schneer surrounded by people who adored her the the adored leader of uh you know groups of girls who would you know do anything to 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 re who revered her and who continued to revere her in some ways there's something there was something still um missing in her ability to fully be herself and 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 that was something that i think is true of of leaders, it's true of older women, it's true of educators. There's something lonely about, uh, about that position of being a teacher. And I'm older than she is, she was when she died. And I and the the, the ways that all the girls in, in, in the school had a crush on the young, you know, cute teachers that came from Germany. I mean, there's something that I feel connects me to her much more deeply than, than than anything that I was told in Beis Yaakov. And, and, and those hours that I spent in that freezing archive, um, I just feel she gave me something in my life as well as whatever it is I was able to give back to her with the biography. Thank you. Wow, Nomi, thank, thank you. Thank you, I had to mute myself. <laughs> thank you. That so was just much. unbelievable, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you so much. So I know that a lot of people here probably have a lot of questions and comments and um, to ask our panelists. So I guess I would ask you if you can to put your questions into the chat and then we can ask the panelists your questions. I think there was one question that came up while Nomi was was speaking, and it was about um, looking at Sarah Schneer as a mother versus looking at her as a sister, and the ways that she wanted to be a sister, and there was kind of this um, insistence on her being mother, mother Sarah, mother Sarah Schneer, and um, I think we talked about it in terms of the pain that 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 she felt about that. But where do you think it, that came from? What what was the need to make her into a mother as opposed to a sister? I'm asking all the panelists, whoever wants to answer. I think there was the some of inherent tension with having the head of a movement that in some ways was to to reaffirm the Jewish family so and and promote the traditional roles of family to have the leader of that woman uh, leader of that movement be a divorced woman and a radical woman and having a mother mother is a not radical way to think of a woman leader so emphasizing the role of mother kind of de-radicalizes Sarshner, either intentionally or meaning they may have done it because they wanted to de-radicalize her or realized that in referring to her as a mother, that was a way of making her less threatening and making Beis Yaakov more acceptable. And, and that kind of rhetoric you see everywhere. You see that all the time, that rhetoric around uh, women revolutionaries and pioneers, how like, no, no, they're really traditional in in a way you see that rhetoric and that may have been the same but I think there's a twofold element of you know it's a less threatening it's a familiar role and it's also kind of dispels the tension of the fact that she she herself was not living that traditional role that the rhetoric around base Yaakov was was promoting so in creating and making her a mother she didn't have children all of base Yaakov students are her children and also maybe make I also maybe a little bit of the sadness piece that kind of makes us all feel better to say like, okay, but she had a lot of, we're all her children might make just the future generations feel less sad about the kind of um, personal adversity that she encountered. 
not that we know if she wanted to have children or not, but you know, that's just kind of that assumption. Thank you. Um, here's one of the things that I don't think we learn in Beis Yaakov. Um, uh, there's a question here um, about her motivations for starting a school and the problem of Jewish girls and women going into sex work at that time. And possibly one of the reasons why, you know, it went through was because the, the leadership was concerned about this. Can somebody speak to that? Am I the sex work person? Um, <laughs> so um, I was actually really surprised to learn a couple of things. First of all, that um, in the 1903 rabbinic conference in Krakow, where the, found, the necessity of founding a school system for Orthodox girls was discussed, the problem of the uh, what was then known as the international white slave trade uh, was a big part of the reason why we need to do something. Um, it was well known around the world that um, Orthodox Jews were overrepresented in um, the international sex traffic rings as both pimps and prostitutes. And one solution to that was considered education. That was a solution that was proposed for many different quarters. In the 1903 conference, people said it, this was discussed very obliquely. Um, what I discovered is that Beis Yaakov, I could show you another slide of this, actually, Sarah Schneer herself never mentioned prostitution, as far as I'm aware of. And it was never discussed in Beis Yaakov but most of the money for Beis Yaakov came from the wealthier communities of um, Central Europe and uh, Eastern uh, and, and uh, Western Europe and the United States. And in those communities, Beis Yaakov actually used the fight against the international white slave trade as a fundraising um, engine and they would go to those conferences. And that's why Eleanor Roosevelt was on the advisory committee of the International Beis Yaakov. On their letterhead, they would say, um, Beis Yaakov Organization for the Protection and Education of Jewish Girls and Women. And protection is code word for um, the fight against sex traffic. So um, it isn't as if Beis Yaakov imagined itself in the schools as fighting against sex traffic. It was more of a, it's in the background of why the rabbis were, the ones who were okay with it, felt compelled to do something about the problem of women defecting from orthodoxy. Obviously, when I say problem, their problem, not my problem. Um, and it's an, also how Beis Yaakov raised funds um, but the, the modesty norms, um, by the way, can I say one thing that I forgot to say uh, in my dramatic little throwing my soul open? Um, I forgot to say that, that the diary is very different from all the official Beis Yaakov stuff in which, Beis, in which Sarah Schneer had to cover up all kinds of things. So things were taken from, so she would, in her, the parts of her diary that were, reprinted, she, instead of saying that she went to the theater and she saw an interesting play, they would say she read a midrash about the theater. So finding out who Sarah Schneer was from the Orthodox literature was very hard, but I think that was part of the dynamic of if you have to keep hiding who you are within the Orthodox world, that must have been part of why um, she was lonely, is, is what I would say. So, so no, so Beis Yaakov, the prostitution was not part of Beis Yaakov internal discourse, for sure not. It was just part of the fundraising development office, let's just say. All right, thank you. Um, okay, there have been a few questions here about the four of you. And Basia, I just, I don't know what your connection is like, but if you can hear me for you as well about um, being products of a Beis Yaakov education, um, going in a lot of different fields uh, and places where Beis Yaakov might not originally have thought he might go, and yet still being very connected to Sarah Schneer. Um, 
and I assume it's different for each one of you, but I wonder, um, or I guess these questions are wondering about um, the, your connection to Beis Yaakov as opposed to your connection to Sarah Schneer and how you kind of parse those things out. Talia, you want to take it? Yeah, yeah, certainly happy to start. Um, so I guess uh, something that I, I often say is that I, I was never really uh, part of the Beis Yaakov world. I was more of a visitor in the Beis Yaakov world. Um, I, I was raised, you know, more or less modern Orthodox, whatever that means. Um, and then I, I went to a, a Beis Yaakov for high school. Um, so, you know, I spent four years immersed in that world. And that world was, you know, very important to me then. And it remains important to me now. But it's not... Um, an identity that I had in a, you know, really meaningful, long-term, serious way. Um, so, like, in some ways, I feel like a little bit of an interloper there. Um, but, uh, so I guess that's kind of the way I conceptualize my relationship to the Beis Yaakov world and the Beis Yaakov movement. It's a world that I can kind of visit when I choose to and go back to when I want to, but I can also, you know, very seamlessly leave. Um, and that's, you know, where, where I am and where I'm happy being. Um, and I guess just thinking about my connection to Sarah Schneer, she was just, you know, I think the more we hear about her today, the cooler we hear she is. Um, you know, the more the more details I learn about her life and the more things I, I find out about her, I'm just like, man, she was so, so cool. Um, it's it's just she was a, a ridiculous person in her time, you know, and I mean ridiculous in the, you know, in its most positive uh, connotation. Um, and is just someone that I, I think we all need to learn more about and we all can, you know, gain incredible inspiration from. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that was a lame answer, but that's me. <laughs> be great answer. Talia, that was so interesting because I feel like um, I'm, I'm with my son right now. He was wake, he woke up, so I had to like do this. But um, um, so the interesting thing about my life is, is this the opposite of yours, actually. Um, Talia, like, cause I was, I was grounded and went to base Yaakov from the age of two and a half to eighth grade. And, um, because I came from a broken family, I managed to get myself, like, I managed to go to dance classes on Sundays somehow because my parents were so distracted. And so, um, by the time I was supposed to go to high school, I had discovered there was something called the high school of performing arts. So um, I finished Beisak of eighth grade and my father was very set on me actually going to Sarashnira High School. <laughs> so I, ironically, it was Sarashnira High School that I was supposed to go to, according to my father. And Beisak was, um, and um, High School Performing Arts was something that was animating my, my, uh, my soul, my interests, like my body, my, like what I was naturally geared towards. And Instead, we compromised on a school on a school called Shalamis, which is actually a modern ortho. It was like kind of half modern Orthodox and half half um, religious, like very religious. So somewhere in between. And um, and there, I like you know got exposed to like coeducational summer programs and stuff like that. But um, like I remember, like my my um, I found out about like like the the tour after sophomore year that you can go to Israel like and be with boys and I told my father that it's not actually a co-ed tour that you start from the north the girls start from the north and the boys start from the south and then we 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 have pizza in Yushalayim for just lunch one day but it wasn't co-educational it was you know whatever so I mean I think my and I think like as an artist like it was something very uh I don't know if I'm answering the question but I'm I'm definitely um, based out of Sarah Nera and how those things also animate my life today um, happens because I remember when I first started to write like instrumental, like music that was inspired by world music, like I didn't have the words, they didn't sound good with English anymore. And I had all these like Sakim that like Talia was talking about all these um, verses that I'd memorized my whole life and all those verses ended up in my music. And that became my band, Pharaoh's Daughter, because I was able to kind of draw back from all this. We memorized books and Birkot Yaakov, Birchat Yaakov and Deborah's song and Miriam's song. And so we had like this, like tons and tons and tons of tons of text, and a lot of them very meaningful and inspiring. Um, and yet also kind of com confrontational with the lifestyle that I was actually choosing. So it was always kind of this tension 
between like this very rebellious, very self-driven, you know, and yet I was super indoctrinated to have a child. So in my last hour, this little one here became a reality. And I can't still to this day figure out whether I really, I, it wasn't, I don't know if it was a grief talking about motherhood, uh, about the idea of not having a child brought me so much grief, like palpable. Like I heard, I would hear a children's blessing and I would just burst out into tears um, for years and years and years until I have my own son. And so this other indoctrination is so powerful, palpable and like inside, like the way I, the grounding, the ground that I was brought up with. So I don't, so that's a little bit of a, an answer from my perspective. Wow. Thank you, Basia. Thank you for those really you know, personal and honest words. Um, I'm actually going to ask another question because I see that we're running out of time. So uh, Leslie, I know you're off the hook for that one. <laughs> um, um, I guess my last question is if you could harness that energy and that drive and that persistence of Sarah Schneer today, what would you do? What do you think she would think needs to be done or using, using her spirit, what would you want to do? And I said, there's no shortage of issues to work on. Um, I don't, I, I would move away from what I think Sarah Schneer would do. I, I don't really think that's relevant. She lives in a totally different time period. It, I don't know, I think that's like, like a helpful way, but I, I do think about how would Sarah Schneer act? Like, how can we learn from her model of leadership? And I say this all the time to people, like, you just have to do something. There's no shortage of issues. Um, Anyone needs suggestions? I can I can make some, um, but, but I I think a, there's a, sometimes this feeling of like you know this kind of like sitting around and complaining about an issue, but like you know the leadership's not doing anything, and what Sarah Schneider would say is if the leadership's not doing anything, so become the leadership. You you we are the leadership, so you just do something. Thank you. I mean, I'm a professor, so, I, you know, I'm not, and I'm not orthodox, but it is a kind of life project, the Basiaco project, which I hope, you know, there's a few people, Danny is responsible for constructing the initial website. It's, Leslie is represented in there. Um, I saw Maxine, who's on here, is, is now in a class I'm teaching at University of Toronto. The dream, I mean, it's not going to change the world, but the dream is to, to, to really provide a kind of space for recording this history. It's, and also letting the, you know, the orthodox, orthodoxy is seen in popular culture as basically men, um, right? A sea of black. Um, I don't know how they think those men reproduce with their black hats, you know, just one black hat giving birth to another black hat. Um, and or maybe they assume that that women in these cultures are just completely, you know, patriarchally patriarchally suppressed and have no, you know, do nothing but, you know, have children. And um, they have no idea that this is a distinctive Orthodox women's culture, which doesn't map onto the other divisions of Hasidism versus yeshiva versus whatever, which is global and transnational and um, you know, has many, many, many thousands of graduates in all walks of life. I think there's someone doing the homeland security job right now. I forget who it is. And there's Ruchi Forster. In other words, this is a story that is completely invisible. And even, and then when I tell people I'm working on, on I'm still working on Beis Yaakov, they're like, oh, Beis Yaakov, the men in the Orthodox world. They think it's funny. Oh, the production. Yeah, the plays. Um, there, so it's dismissed within the Orthodox world for its significance. And the fact that all these women revere a woman, a historical woman, who's, whose life we're just really beginning to learn about, I think. I mean, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Yeah, it's academic work, but it's also soul work. Thank you. Talia or Basia, do you want to add anything?
Okay, well, we are exactly on time. Well, maybe 946, which I think has never happened before in the history of her Torah. So um, not only was this an amazing evening and we learned so much from all of you, thank you so much, but we actually ended almost on time. So that's that's really great. I want to thank Ariella Mortgoetz, who is the founder and visionary of Sviva, uh, for everything that she does to make this happen. Uh, and turn it over to you, Ariella. Okay, first off, Aliza, I need to apologize to you. <laughs> because when you originally suggested that we do this, I and all of my preconceptions bit my tongue and said, mm -hmm, okay. And I need to just look at each of you tonight and just say, oh my goodness, thank you. This was so mind-blowingly fascinating to understand. I mean, maybe this is about me, but I'm, I'm totally intrigued by what makes a leader a leader. What are the things that motivate somebody to be so discontent with the status quo that they actually, like Leslie, you were saying, do something. And to hear how deep her leadership, her commitment to being an inspiring leader and making that change to make sure that it lasted long after her. Like for me, that's that's amazing. I, I have so much more reading to do. I am like, I just wanna sit at your feet for a lot longer and learn about this woman who did so much in such a short amount of time. It's, it's incredible. So I'm Grateful to each of you for opening my eyes in such an amazing way. And Aliza, as always, for showing me that you know best and then some. This was incredible and I'm so glad and I'm hoping that we honored um, the memory of somebody pretty incredible tonight. Uh, I, feel, I feel really, really positive about that and I'm grateful to have been part of it. So thank you for letting me be here. Um, I want to make a gentle ask please consider helping us show our amazing educators the respect they deserve for their time and tremendous talent with a donation of any size. I promise every single small nickel makes a very big difference. You can go to sviva.org slash donate. Her Torah is dependent on the support of our beautiful community. And if you'd like to sponsor a Her Torah gathering in honor or in memory of someone dear to you, we would love to celebrate that individual in the future. So please, please be in touch. Um, also, you're going to see in the chat a link to a 90-second survey that will help us continue to do this better. Any idea that you have, it's an opportunity for you to share and to please give us feedback. It, we read every single one, and it really makes a difference. Thank you. Um, I hope that we will see you again in March for our upcoming Her Torah and Her Power Women's Empowerment Gathering. You will find all of the info on our website, and I will be sure to bombard you in your inbox also. And the conversation is always welcome to be continued in our closed Facebook group. It's an opportunity to share amazing articles that I can't even keep up with in the chat, but I will try my darndest. Please share, invite other women to events that you think are interesting because I know that I find things that people are sharing so fascinating. So if you have something that's locally going on that you wanna invite other people to do, please do. It's a space to ask questions, to share your personal experiences and to continue this conversation. Um, you'll see all of that. Hold on, I, I can share it, but we'll put it in the chat also. But I am going to stick around for a little bit longer to say hello to all of you amazing people. Um, and with just such gratitude for, for being together like this and learning about somebody so inspiring. I'm, I'm like, I'm up here. <laughs> I don't know how I can go and like do the dishes or something now. But thank you to everyone. You can take yourselves off mute and say hello and to give a round of applause to our amazing, amazing educators. Thank you, each one of you, for being here. Thank you. Woohoo! Um, I have a round of uh, the Besiako song. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.